You're listening ad-free on Wondery Plus. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. Nineteen ninety was not off to a good start for thirty four year old Keith Hunter Jesperson. The long haul trucker's divorce was being finalized, and his girlfriend had called from a gas station in Tennessee to dump him. She had left town with another truck driver and now wanted Keith to clear out of her house or start paying rent. When the six foot six, 250 pound Jesperson went into a tavern in Portland to shoot some pool, he was lonely and angry. It wasn't just his girlfriend's betrayal that was bothering him. Money was tight. He was unable to drive his truck because he had too many traffic violations to get back on the road. Collecting unemployment was not paying the bills. And he had been forced to sell his beloved fishing gear and mountain bike in order to buy Christmas presents for his three kids back in Spokane. 23-year-old Tanya Bennett was chatting with two men when she spotted Jesperson playing pool by himself. She flung her arms around Jesperson's waist and invited him to join their game. He declined, knowing he would be expected to pay for a round of beers. He left and went back to his ex-girlfriend's house to watch TV. But unable to stop thinking about the young woman, Jesperson drove back to the tavern. As he approached the front door, Tanya Bennett walked out. Jesperson invited her to dinner. Tanya accepted his invitation and climbed into his car. Having suffered oxygen deprivation at birth, Tanya had intellectual disabilities, like trouble understanding social rules and understanding the results of their actions. Her family said she was naive, overly friendly, and she had been in and out of drug and alcohol rehab and was known to hang out at local bars, hustling drinks, and pool games. Jesperson told Tanya he needed to stop at his house first to grab some more money. But once he got her inside the house, he trapped her in a bedroom twice She escaped his grip and ran to the door, but both times he caught her, and when Tanya demanded Jesperson hurry up and, quote, just get it over with so he could take her to dinner as promised, it reminded him of what his wife used to say. He became enraged and started punching her in the face. He smashed her nose, broke her jaw, and pounded her mouth until broken teeth pierced through her lips. Jesperson decided that if he did not kill her, he would wind up in prison for the assault. So he drove his giant fist into her throat. She blacked out, but regained consciousness a few minutes later, and he repeatedly punched her in the throat, crushing her trachea. Uncertain if she was still alive, he took a three-foot piece of nylon rope from the garage, wrapped it around her throat, and made sure she was dead. Afterwards, he sat in the kitchen and enjoyed a cup of coffee. From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the second season of Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed lots of murderers, including serial killers. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. 
it is difficult to get a satisfying answer without diving deep into their mindsets. So that's what we're doing. And I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is Keith Hunter Jesperson, the happy face killer. Concerned that his fingerprints would be on the metal buttons of her jeans, Jesperson cut out the fly with a steak knife and threw it into the fireplace. Then, to create an alibi, he left Tanya's body at the house and drove back to the tavern. After ordering a beer and chatting with the bartender, he made sure he was seen leaving alone. He then returned to the house around 9.30 p.m., and started cleaning the blood from the walls and ceiling. At midnight, Jesperson loaded her into the front seat of his car and drove toward the Columbia River Gorge, about 10 miles east of Portland. He pulled over when he came across a large ravine and dragged her body about 60 feet down the embankment. Spooked by some lights in the distance, he left her there uncovered. The next day, a cyclist spotted the body and reported it to the police. The lack of evidence at the ravine and the autopsy made it difficult for investigators to link a killer to the murder. Their only leads were the two men that Tanya Bennett had been seeing playing pool with at the tavern. Once found, the men were cleared. Police then appealed to the public for information. About two weeks after Tanya's body was discovered, 58-year-old Laverne Pavlinak claimed her 39-year-old boyfriend, John Sosnowski, had committed the murder. Laverne had a history of implicating her boyfriend in unsolved crimes. She had previously told the FBI he was responsible for a bank robbery, which proved to be false. Portland police were skeptical, and the piece of gene material Laverne produced for the investigators did not match Tanya's missing fly. And the purse she reportedly found in John's car could not be identified as Tanya's. Laverne's story was so bizarre, the police did not charge John. Not giving up, Laverne decided to come clean and tell the police she had helped kill Tanya Bennett and dispose of her body. She even recorded a confession saying that John forced her to hold the rope around Tanya's neck while he raped and murdered her. This accomplished Laverne's mission, and the police arrested John. However, it also backfired on her. The 59-year-old grandmother herself was also arrested and charged in Tanya's murder. Before her trial in January 1991, Laverne Pavlinak recanted her entire confession and claimed all the details she knew about the crime came from the media. She told the authorities she made up the story to get out of an abusive relationship with John. During her nine-day trial, A confession written on the door of a bathroom stall at a bus station in Montana suddenly appeared. It read, I killed Tanya Bennett, January 21st, 1990, in Portland, Oregon. I beat her to death, raped her, and loved it. People took the blame, and I'm free. A small, happy face was drawn just below the confession, a signature that would later become Jesperson's calling card. However, the judge in Laverne's trial dismissed the anonymous confession, and the prosecutor said it was obviously written by, and I quote, some kook who read about the trial in Portland newspapers and decided to get his kicks by writing on the bathroom door. Laverne Pavlinak was found guilty of aiding and abetting Tanya Bennett's murder and sexual assault. Fearing the death penalty, 
John Sovsnosky pled no contest to murder and kidnapping charges in March 1991. Both he and Laverne were sentenced to life in prison. While police and prosecutors were busy convicting Laverne and John, Keith returned to work as a long-haul trucker. He held no permanent address. This mobility made it easy for him to continue killing mostly transient women and dumping their bodies on the road. For another five years, he remained completely undetected. In April 1990, Four months after Tanya's murder, Jesperson stopped in a shopping center parking lot in Mount Shasta, California, on his way to a construction job in Sacramento. He struck up a conversation with a 21-year-old who was nursing her infant child. Jesperson took her to a convenience store where they bought some beer. They drove to a park where Jesperson forced her to perform oral sex on him. When she tried to leave, he put her in a headlock and attempted to snap her neck. He stopped when the infant started crying in the back seat and he let her go. She then went to the police and filed assault charges against him. Hours later, police tracked him down at a local rest stop. Now, prepare to get really frustrated. Keith somehow managed to convince the detectives that she was lying. He said he had given her his name as well as the name of the construction company where he was headed to work. Keith reasoned a rapist wouldn't share that information with their victim. The detectives let him go, but told him he still might be charged after further investigation. Keith Jesperson decided He would never leave a witness alive again. In August 1992, Keith met a woman who he referred to as Claudia at a break check area in San Bernardino, California. Claudia approached Jesperson and asked for a ride to Phoenix, Arizona. After they had sex, Jesperson maintained that Claudia demanded money or else she would accuse Jesperson of rape. Instead, Jesperson duct taped her wrists and ankles together and subjected her to multiple days of captivity and rape. In Claudia's final hours, Jesperson repeatedly choked her until she blacked out, allowing her to regain consciousness before doing it again. He repeated this until she was lifeless. He dumped her body in a deserted area off the highway near Blythe, California. Less than a month later, in September 1992, Jesperson committed his third murder, a 32-year-old sex worker. He claimed that she climbed into his truck uninvited and woke him up. In a fit of rage, he choked her to death by pressing his fist on her throat. To ensure she was dead, he stomped on her neck before throwing her in a trash pile. When police found her body, they originally attributed her death to a drug overdose. On November 13, 1992, Keith arranged to meet up with one of his favorite sex workers at a truck stop in Salem, Oregon. 26-year-old Lori Ann Pentland always gave him the attention he craved. But on this occasion, after their session had lasted longer than usual, she insisted on charging him double for her time. The hostility Keith felt towards women flared up. He punched her in the throat, knocking her out multiple times before finally killing her and dumping her body behind a store where it was discovered the next day. Six months passed before Jesperson killed again. In March 1993, he visited another California truck stop 
where he picked up a female hitchhiker on her way to Sacramento. When they pulled over to a rest area, she willingly had sex with him. Afterwards, he strangled her to death. Her body was found months later, but was not identified until April of 2022. For about a year after that, Jesperson began setting fires, thinking that would give him the same thrill that killing did. He set more than a dozen fires in California, Washington, Oregon, Nevada, and Arizona. He later said he got a rush watching the firefighters race to the scene to fight the blaze that he had created. In March 1994, after seeing another article about the couple who were in prison for killing Tanya Bennett, Keith became frustrated by his lack of recognition. Wanting validation, but still worried about being caught, he sent an anonymous letter to the Beaverton, Oregon courthouse confessing to the murder of Tanya. He included details only the killer could know. For example, he mentioned that the nylon rope used to strangle Tanya was frayed on one end and burnt on the other. He then signed the letter with a happy face, but no name. Police determined that the handwriting in the letter matched the graffiti confession scrawled on the bathroom stall in Montana. But, once again, took Keith's note as a hoax. So, a month later, Jesperson once again sent an anonymous handwritten letter. But this time... It was to the Oregonian newspaper. Investigative journalist Phil Stanford decided to pursue the details in the six-page letter. Jesperson's letter interested him not only because it detailed the killing of five separate women in different parts of the country, but also because it contradicted the evidence presented at the Tanya Bennett murder trial. Writing these letters became a pattern for Keith. He loved playing with the media and the attention it brought him. In another letter to the Oregonian, he once again included information not known to the public. And once again, he signed the letter with a smiley face. It was then, while advocating for the two innocent people in jail, that Phil Stanford gave the anonymous writer the nickname, The Happy Face Killer. On September 12, 1994, Jesperson picked up a woman in Tampa, Florida. During the night she spent in Jesperson's sleeper cab, he raped and strangled her. This time, before he dumped her body, he put two white plastic zip ties around her neck in case he ever had to prove that she was his kill. Her body was discovered two days later. Jesperson had killed six women when he picked up his next victim, a 21-year-old hitchhiker in Wyoming in January 1995. They hit it off, and Jesperson agreed to give her a ride to Colorado to see her father. On the road, he paid for her meals and other expenses. She even used his phone card to call her father a couple of times. After her father told her not to come to Colorado, The woman changed her plans and wanted Jesperson to take her to Indianapolis to see her ex-boyfriend instead. Once again, Jesperson felt like he was being used, so he raped, strangled, and killed her. Because she had used his phone card to call her family, he worried that she could be traced back to him. So Keith tied her body face down to the bottom of his semi-truck and dragged her for 12 miles in an effort to make her fingerprints, face, and teeth unrecognizable. He then dumped her remains in Nebraska, where they were not discovered for another eight months. It was shortly after, while passing through Seattle, that he bumped into an old girlfriend, Julie Winningham, 
and the couple quickly rekindled their relationship. After spending a week together, Julie began to infuriate Jesperson, demanding that he pay for her court costs stemming from a DUI conviction. Jesperson sexually assaulted Julie before strangling her to death and dumping her naked body in Clark County, Washington, where she was discovered on March 11th. After police identified Winningham, they spoke with her family members about known associates. Julie's mother said two weeks before her death, she had introduced her to a large, long-haul trucker and announced they were engaged. This trucker had helped her daughter sell her car. Police tracked down the new car owner and saw that a man named Keith Hunter Jesperson was the witness on the bill of sale. Police learned that Jesperson was employed by a trucking company based in Washington. The trucking company cooperated and helped locate Jesperson's next scheduled load. When the sheriffs approached him, he agreed to be questioned and he gave hair and blood samples. He admitted to dating Julie, but denied having anything to do with her murder. The police had no physical evidence to hold him, so they had to let him go. Jesperson immediately fled to Tucson, where he penned a letter to his brother Brian, confessing to the murder of Julie Winningham and seven other women. He wrote that he regretted the shame he brought to the family. His biggest concern was that his kids would be bullied in school because of their serial killer father. He did not, however, express any regret for killing his victims. His brother turned the letter over to the police. After trying twice to commit suicide, Jesperson gave up and made a collect call to a detective in Washington to turn himself in. This time, it was not an anonymous note. This time, Keith Hunter Jesperson was finally ready to let the world know that he was the happy face killer. Keith Hunter Jesperson was born on April 6, 1955, in Chilliwack, British Columbia, Canada. Chilliwack is about 50 miles east of Vancouver and less than 15 miles from the United States border. It is an area surrounded by mountains with an abundance of lakes and forests. Keith was the middle child of five, born to Les and Gladys Jesperson. While his father had no use for religion or church, Keith's mother grew up in a very puritanical home where there was never a drop of alcohol and any mention of sex was taboo. Keith felt that he was unfairly singled out for punishment by his father, whom Keith described as both a good father and a, quote, hardworking drunk with severe mood swings. He routinely belted his kids at the slightest infraction. His mother, a traditional housewife, was only occasionally effective in shielding her children from her husband's abuse. Keith claimed she could also be physically abusive toward her children. Keith would later state that his parents never hugged or kissed their children or each other. While he knew his mother was kinder than his father, Keith later said he wished she had done more to protect him from his father's beatings. His father also prohibited his mother from joining them on family trips because he was ashamed of her after she gained a significant amount of weight. According to a psychologist who tested Keith after his incarceration, this certainly fed into his distancing from and objectification of women. 
meaning his father's horrible treatment of his mother set the tone for Keith not to respect women. His father had also gotten away with murder. He killed a man in a hit-and-run accident and was never caught. When his mother was dying of cancer in 1985, Keith mentioned he felt uncomfortable when she hugged him goodbye. In a case study of Jesperson conducted by neurocriminologist and clinical psychologist Dr. Robert Shug, Keith told him, quote, Want to hear something sad? A week before my mom passes away, Dad invites us kids up to say goodbye to her. He says, Go in there to kiss your mother goodbye. I went into her bedroom, laid next to her, and had to explain why I couldn't kiss her goodbye because it would have been the only kiss I would have given her in my life. I didn't want to remember it that way. So we hugged instead. He claimed that he felt indifferent about her death and did not cry at her funeral. Keith's childhood was not a happy one. His distant mother and ambivalent siblings did nothing to assuage his feelings that he was merely baggage, like a weight that his father took along with him. The only person with whom he felt a special bond was his maternal grandfather, and the two of them often went out fishing together on his grandfather's boat. The Jespersons were all outdoor adventurers. Keith was happiest when he was surrounded by nature. He had trouble making friends and spent a lot of time alone. While nature might have made him happy, he certainly did not treat it well. Keith began killing and torturing animals around the age of six, poking, kicking, hitting, and lighting them on fire. He enjoyed wounding them and watching them suffer. His father hated cats, so he often sent Keith to get rid of the strays that came on their property, which he did often by strangulation. Keith first attempted to kill a human at the age of 10. His parents were friends with a couple who had a boy the same age as Keith. Whenever this family visited, their son would always do something mischievous and then blame Keith. This usually resulted in Keith getting beaten by his father. One day, Keith had had enough and brutally beat the boy, leaving him unconscious. He said that he would have killed him had he not been stopped by his father, who then beat Keith severely. Keith's second attempt was on a neighborhood kid who constantly bullied him. One summer day, the boy held Keith underwater at the lake until he blacked out. Later, Keith returned the favor and held the bully underwater at the public swimming pool. The lifeguard had to jump in and rescue the boy. Once again, Keith said that he fully intended to drown the boy to death. By the time Keith was 12 and in sixth grade, he was already over six feet tall and 200 pounds. His size set him even further apart from his peers. They would taunt him and call him names like Igor because of his size. It did not help that his family had moved to the United States and settled in Selah, Washington, a place Keith would never feel was home. He started hanging out with a group of boys who nailed cats, small dogs, and crows to boards and threw knives and firecrackers at them. He continued this behavior on his own and even took his abuse further, torturing and killing deer, rats, coyotes, odd dogs, and cats with his hunting rifle. His sisters were horrified by his actions and would tell their father about Keith's cruelty. Keith didn't understand why they cared so much about, quote, dumb animals. When he was 14, 
Keith went on a fishing trip with his father to the Washington coast. He maintained that one evening, an 18-year-old woman he encountered seduced him, and he lost his virginity. He later said she raped him. We do not know if this is true, but if so, it would certainly have added to his disrespect for women. In high school, Keith joined the wrestling team. One of the exercise drills in practice was the rope climb. Keith struggled to pull his 200-pound frame to the top. The first time he succeeded, the rope detached from the bracket and he fell 25 feet to the hardwood floor. His feet hit the floor first and his head slammed on the ground. He blacked out for several minutes. When he came to, He was in severe pain. He required surgery to repair the damaged ligaments in his legs. I think it's necessary to point out that Keith suffered from a great many head traumas starting at age eight, including the fall at wrestling practice. For example, he bore the impact of a head-on collision with a truck at 19 and another major automobile crash at 33 years old. He also suffered from zinc poisoning at age 21 while welding in a closed garage. We've spoken in previous episodes about how head trauma can cause neurological damage. The traumas he suffered, of which I have only listed a few, could have had a profound effect on Keith's behavior, his violent behavior. However, brain scans showed that Keith does not seem to be characterized by widespread frontal lobe deficits, something that is common among scans of other serial killers. But because the scan did not show that problem, it doesn't mean there was not trauma and that Keith's head injuries did not affect him. Keith's siblings all went to university or community college but his father did not think Keith was worth the investment. Instead, he hired Keith to do manual labor work for his businesses. At the age of 19, Keith met Rose Pernick, a 17-year-old high school senior who was waitressing at a local diner. After asking her out on numerous occasions, Keith finally convinced Rose to go on a date. They hit it off and were married one year later in August 1975. Keith held a variety of jobs operating heavy machinery before going back to work for his father's trailer park. Eventually, he and Rose moved to Canada, where Keith got a union job as a welder. It was the best-paying job he would ever have. But he got caught stealing leather work overalls and was fired. The couple then returned to Washington. Keith started driving tractor trailers before their first child was born in 1980. They had two more children in quick succession. Keith adored his kids, but he had a voracious sexual appetite and he was frustrated by his unsatisfying sexual relationship with Rose. Keith began having extramarital affairs while on the road. In 1988, he met the girlfriend that he would eventually leave his wife for. While they were extremely sexually compatible, he regretted leaving Rose and missed his kids. He later stated that leaving his wife was the turning point in his life. It's important to note that all of Keith's murders stemmed from a sexual interaction with his victim. He would strangle them during or immediately after intercourse. In Dr. Shug's research study of Jesperson, he applied several assessment techniques, including the structured clinical interview for DSM-4 Axis II personality disorders and the Rorschach test, as well as a comprehensive battery of neuropsychological tests. Keith's responses in his Rorschach test indicate that his sexual preoccupations were, quote, 
marked by themes of degradation, shame, and objectification of women. Further, while he indicated a robust sexual history and adequate capacity for sexual gratification, he denied sexual interest. Keith's eroticizing of sexual control over a woman was most likely bolstered by this inconsistency, and that suggests an immature understanding of sexual thoughts, behaviors, gratification, and or relationships. He had difficulties interpreting sexual cues and understanding sexually ambiguous interactions with others. For example, when one of the tests showed a woman with a flirtatious look, he interpreted the facial expression as disappointed. Keith would have a script in his head of how every sexual interaction should go. And when anything varied from that script, for example, when Tanya showed a lack of interest in their sexual intercourse, he became violent. Keith also showed a profound emotional inhibition. He was more likely to, quote, reflect and reason rather than spontaneously react to emotions, impulses, or circumstances. This may be why, when he experienced severe outside stressors, for example, his divorce, and subsequent breakup, the buildup of his repressed emotions overwhelmed him and he exploded. Whenever his trucking company would put him up in hotels, Keith would binge read detective magazines and watch reruns of Perry Mason. He went to libraries and read books about serial killers thinking he could learn a lot about where his compulsion to kill came from. He realized how easy it was for long-haul truckers to get away with murdering transient women. It wasn't even necessary to hide their bodies. He learned police often have less evidence available to them when a body is dumped in a different location than where the murder actually occurred. Keith's drive to be recognized for his skill as a murderer stemmed from deep-seated narcissism. According to Shug's test results, Keith met four of the five narcissistic personality disorder criteria, those being grandiosity, entitlement, lack of empathy, and arrogance. He also met three of the four criteria for schizoid personality, These criteria include a lack of interest in close relations. Results of some of Keith's other tests were equally substantial. He met three of the five borderline personality disorder criteria, including impulsivity, intense and unstable interpersonal relationships, and inappropriate explosive anger that he had difficulty controlling. Keith also met the Diagnostic Criteria for Antisocial Personality Disorder, or ASPD. Since the age of eight years old, he showed a lack of regard for the law and the rights of those around him. He did not care who or what he hurt, and he had no remorse when he was the source of someone's pain. After his call to the Washington detective turning himself in, Keith Hunter Jesperson was arrested for the death of Julie Ann Winningham on March 25, 1995. He was extradited to Clark County Jail in Washington. While Keith was held in the county jail, he readily confessed to Julie Winningham's murder and seven others. He created maps and drawings to indicate where he had killed each of his eight victims. He believed that if he gave every detail, he would not be extradited to Wyoming, where he feared the death penalty. As he confessed his crimes to authorities, 
Keith continued writing letters and getting them smuggled out to media outlets in spite of a gag order imposed by the court. He ignored his lawyer's advice and did everything he could to get attention from the media. Keith was also determined to embarrass the law enforcement personnel involved in his case, pointing out all the mistakes they made. While awaiting trial, he sent a confession letter to a local news station in Oregon, signing it with his trademark smiley face. In the letter, he referred to himself as the happy face killer. Initially, Portland police did not take his confession of Tanya Bennett's murder seriously, but Keith wanted the credit he knew he was due. He sent another letter to the newspaper journalist, Phil Stanford, who continued to put pressure on Portland detectives to investigate Keith's claims. In September 1995, Portland investigators asked Keith to show them the canyon where he dumped Tanya Bennett's body. He was only off by a few yards. Then Keith mapped out the area where he had dumped Tanya's purse. A search crew was able to locate her purse in the brush with her driver's license still inside. Finally, in October 1995, Keith was charged with Tanya Bennett's murder. It took four more months for a judge to release Laverne and John. Keith pled guilty to the murder of his former girlfriend, Julie Ann Winningham. Over the next few weeks, as he waited for sentencing, he pled no contest to the 1990 murder of Tanya Bennett. He received a life sentence of at least 30 years for Tanya's murder, and in December 1995, he received two more life sentences for Julie and Lori Ann Pentland's murders. With three consecutive life sentences, Keith was extradited to California in 2009, where he received his fourth life sentence without the possibility of parole. He was then returned to Oregon State Prison, where he will remain for the rest of his life. Next week on Killer Psyche, Harold Shipman, the original Dr. Death. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Story research and additional writing by Ann Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Senior audio producer, Maxwell Carney. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. With assistance from Jada Williams. Renee Levesque is our production manager. Brandon Clark, Lindsay Whistler, Colin Modell, and Jada Williams are production assistants. Oscar Guido is the producer from Tree Fort Media. From Amazon Music and Wondery, the producer is Stephanie Joaquin. And the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort and Marsha Louie and Erin O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media.